It's just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Kim Harms, DDS. She's a retired dentist, a transition specialist, dental mediator, and conflict management consultant. During her dental career, Dr. Kim's expertise was unmatched. Not only did she run a dental practice with her husband for 30 years, she was a former Minnesota Dental Association president, national delegate, national dental speaker, ADA spokesperson and consumer advisor. She now helps dentists with their practice transitions and conflict management, as well as continues to speak across the country. Kim Harms has been around the block when it comes to dentistry. She practiced dentistry for 30 years in both public and private settings, including owning a dental practice with her husband. Throughout her incredible career, she served on numerous committees, was the first woman president of the Minnesota Dental Association, an ADA spokesperson for consumer advisor for 25 years, and a national delegate among other positions. Through her work as an ADA spokesperson and consumer advisor, she has been featured on the Today Show, CNN, Fox News, National Public Radio, and network affiliates such as CBS, NBC, ABC, all for just a warm up into preparing her for Dentistry Uncensored. In addition, she has been quoted in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, Chicago Tribune, Consumers Digest, Shape Magazine, Good Housekeeping, BuzzFeed, Cosmopolitan, and numerous other print and internet publications, all preparing her to write an article for Dental Town Magazine. Dr. Kim has also written numerous articles for dental publications and lectures across the country. She is also involved with Books for Africa and as a result works closely with dental schools in Rwanda. She brings that breadth of experience to Pine Lake Law Firm as a mediator, conflict management consultant, and transition specialist. Dr. Kim lives with her husband of almost 40 years in Bloomington and enjoys time spent at the cabin with her daughters and grandchildren. She went to the University of Maryland, Bachelor's of Science, um, Maryland uh, School of Dentistry uh, for her doctor of dental surgery. Um, Kim, <clears throat> it's a big honor to bring you in today because in my 32 years, I've never seen dentistry just turned upside down. In fact, I want to, I want to uh, start just showing you some numbers to put into perspective of how this just hit us upside the head. February 3rd, the world had 426 deaths. March 3rd, 3,200. April 3rd, 61,000. May 3rd, a quarter of a million. So, I mean, so March, we closed down our dental office on St. Patrick's Day, um, probably, and not because I'm Irish and there was too much Jameson in my bloodstream to see patients. We actually shut down for the corona and we opened back up on Cinco de Mayo. So the Irish shut us down and the Mexicans <laughs> opened us back up. And my God, the, um, the world is so different. And the reason I was so honored to have you come on the show, you and I are both fans of Naomi Road. And uh, she's the, um, my gosh, she was the president of the NDA, the, the National NSA. And I never told any, I just say, when everybody was talking about the NSA government, CIA, I'd say, I actually, I actually know the president of the NSA. Oh. And they were just like, oh. really? But I would never share that it was the uh, National Speaker Association, but um, they're so stressed. They're so stressed. And I look at um, older people like us. I mean, come on, we both have six grandchildren. We're not um, um, as young as we used to be. But the COVID class of 2020, they're, they're pulling their hair out. I mean, they, they don't know what to do. And then um, we've had some suicides. There's a threat on Dental Town just said suicide. And People are looking at the whole situation and she was married. She had kids. She was the all American dream. I'm sure everybody in her high school, college and dental school would have said, that's the girl that will hit a home run. And she checked out. Um, how are you doing? Well, Howard, uh, thank you. I, I'm, I'm doing well and I'm doing well because I'm resilient. I've been, you know, you and I, uh, because we're old, I'm 63, and we've, we, we've been through life. We've been through a lot of trauma. We've been through a lot of things in our life, and we, we learned to kind of focus on the important things in life. And you know, in dentistry, um, when faced with a crisis, most people, most dentists believe that the most, you know, most important thing they need to do is take care of all the, the management details, make sure they have enough mass, make sure they're getting all of the you know, engineering changes in their office, and, and make sure they protect their patients and their team. Those things they have to do, that's very important. But what they believe also is that the emotional issues will take care of themselves. And I disagree completely. I believe the emotional management 
of this crisis, how we manage our, our brains and help those people around us manage their brains to get through this is, is, is equally important and is critical if we're gonna retain our patients because they need us to be confident and ready to go. If we're gonna maintain our, our team and build our team, we have to do that. And in order to regain our productivity again, we have to focus on the emotional issues and how we, we show our resilience and welcome our, well, even though we're dying on the inside, you know, it's a lot of it's acting. You got to kind of learn how to put a smile on your face. We got to go out there and welcome those patients back in and give that team of ours the confidence that we're going to get through this together. And, and the emotional issues are, are, are something that as dentists, we tend to ignore. And I'm really here to say, to help me help dentists to say, you're going to get through this. We step by step by step, you're going to get through this. This is a temporary issue. Um, it's going to maybe, maybe you'll have to work a little bit longer when you get to be my age. You might re, you may retire a little bit later. Uh, there are going to be some issues you have to deal with temporarily. When they get the vaccine, we'll recheck, relook at things, and we can move on. We still are a wonderful profession, uh, and people need to really focus on that. Well, I mean, airplanes have the greatest safety record, and they always tell you, put your air mask on first and then your child, because you're no good to your child if you pass out. And um, so, um, my gosh, so, so I don't even know where to start with you because you're a plethora of information, but I, I, I want to start, um, I, I want to start with the, the dentist who checked out. I mean, and I, I've been in Phoenix and that's a big, big town. It's um, 3.8 million Metro. So in my 32 years, every single year, a dentist that we all know in this town has checked out one year, it was three. But do you think there's going to be an uptick of that um, because of COVID? I sure hope not. But, but what this does is it adds an additional stress. Now, I am very uh, familiar uh, with suicide. Uh, I, in fact, one of, one of my goals as I'm retired and I came back to work for my daughter at Pine Lake Law Firm and I'm having a ball doing all of this and helping. One of the reasons I'm, I'm back here is I would like to help prevent suicides among dentists. I lost my mother when I was 17 years old suicide. I lost my nephew who had uh, uh, slept through his uh, doctoral dissertation in Japan and jumped off the tallest building to suicide. And then two years later, um, I lost my precious son, Eric, who was 19 years old. He was a student at Columbia University, much like the woman you're describing. He was a guy everybody thought would go far. He was on the dean's list in engineering. He was elected at, at Columbia to the student council. He was recruited by Columbia to, to go there. Uh, he was a jazz pianist, amazing jazz pianist, which has, which one of the reasons he was is he was impulsive. Uh, and uh, he was on top of the world when he came home for Christmas. Two weeks later, his girlfriend, his, you know, thought the love of his life broke up with him. And 45 minutes later, he was gone, he was dead. And that was such a horrible shock to my husband and I, we were practicing still, we were practicing dentistry. And what we learned from that, and again, it's 11 years, you know, so I've, 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 I've had some time, but what we learned from that is how to kind of manage things within an office in a profession where you have to put a smile on your face and look completely confident when those patients come in because they, you know, already in dentistry, we have, um, uh, uh, most people are anxious about coming just before this. They were anxious about coming to the dental office. And so we are, we are working on people who have maybe have had been traumatized before, and we have to have a smile and confidence and focus on that patient, uh, even though you know, there are things going on in our head that we can't show. So it's a very difficult job to do in times like this. And, and, and I'm really urging everyone to really work on seeking the help and do what they need to do to keep their head in a positive place, because if they don't, people are going to pick up on that. And also to get help. I, I suffer from depression. And of, of course, you know, I've got my mother and my son. You know, I, I suffer from depression. And I did when I was practicing as well. And I got treated. I, I get treated for depression. You know, there are treatments out there. there there's, there's help out there. Uh, and I am, I live, you know, a very full life. I have six grandchildren. I live a joyful life. Um, and and who, I never would have thought I could before. But I've learned how to do that. And I just want to give those dentists out there hope to look, not to look at next week or next month or 
or, or their goals that they set on January 1st for their production to just realize this is a little, this is a reset and we're gonna have to do things differently and we're gonna have to scratch a little bit to survive. But dentistry hasn't changed. The need for dentistry hasn't changed. The, the basics of our profession haven't changed. We might have to do some things differently like we did during the AIDS crisis. I mean, you remember that back in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, but but the, the big picture is dentistry is still a great profession. We're gonna do well. We just have to get through this setback. But you know, everything I've read is that the um, on a marriage stress, the death of a child <laughs> is the oh. number one stress. And I think I've read as high as like 96% of married couples that lose a child in the divorce. Um, we were talking earlier, we both have a common friend, uh, Naomi Road, a hygienist. Her brother was the Omar Reed who passed away. And I was most intrigued by Omar because he had five children and he lived long enough to lose how many of them? Yeah, he lost a, he lost a couple. I, I three, don't three, three or four. Yeah. And, and, I, um, and one was, you know, like 19, they, they came home, she was unloading the groceries from the car and dropped and, and, and he said it was an Icelandic stroke um, plague and, you know, they had these strokes. But I used to say to Omar, I said, how do you get up and go, go on? I mean, I, I have four boys. I said, I don't know if I'd survive one. You've done two, you've done three. And so how do guys like Omar Reed and you, I mean, how do you lose a child and maintain a, a dental office and a marriage? I mean, how come you're just not the, the, that chick at the bar uh, just uh, doing shots? I mean, what, how, how, did you, how, did, how did you do that? Well, you know, I... I if, if you leave it alone, if you don't address it, if you don't address the craziness going on in your head and the pain that's going on in your head, if you don't address it, you know, I, I know if I didn't address it, I'd end up as the woman in the bar. But I'll tell you something someone said to me that really helped. First of all, I have a strong faith and, and, and I have a supportive family. I have every possible advantage with my surroundings to help me. That, is, that was very helpful. But I was, in, I was in that ditch and I wanted to jump in that grave with him. So the, the, the immediate aftermath, which is what we're going through right now, you know, what we're going through right now, we're at the grave and we're, you know, we're, we're going to jump, we want to jump in. That's where we are right now. And so you just can't see past that. Um, but I had someone had something happen to me, the best, one of the best advices I've ever had. My husband, Jim, I've been married to him for 40, 44 years, I have to count, 44 years. My husband, Jim, I went to dental school together. Um, and he had a cousin who also who lost his brother at 17. He had been out drinking, his, the friends had uh, passed out, the friends put him in his car, drove up to his house and left him there. But unfortunately, this is Minnesota, it was 26 below and he froze to death. And his parents never ever could get that scene from the front of their head to the back of their head as a memory. They could never ever stop thinking about that as a first when they woke up in the morning and their, their son, Jim's cousin was a patient of ours. And I never forget, I walked out of our office and you're a zombie. And, and most dentists right now are probably zombies. You're like a zombie. You're just walking around trying to see how you're going to get through the next day. I was in my zombie stage and he was there talking to Jim and he said, he looked at me and he said, don't you ever let your remaining two children think that they are not enough. And even after 11 years, I get goosebumps when I, when I even say that. Only he could tell me that at that time. If someone else had said that, I would have punched him, you know, because you're in such pain and you're just going through the agony. But he made me realize that I had two living daughters. And I had a husband. My husband had just been through a liver transplant. He's got um, every disease under the sun. Um, and he was struggling, not only emotionally, but physically as well, to survive this. And I realized that there was more to this than just me. And that was helpful because he told me that, because someone who'd been there. So that's why I'm here as someone who's lost a child, who's been through you know, one of the worst things that can happen to you. Um, and, and I just want to tell you, there's hope. You're going to make it. You just have to go through the steps and get through this horrific time. It's rotten. It's horrible. You're going to be like a zombie. You're going to try to just manage each day. But there's going to be, you're going to be able to move on. There's going to be some changes. Fortunately, we have this, you know, a potential vaccine, which will hopefully should change much of a lot of things. But one of the things we have to remember too, is when we're looking at rebuilding our practices, because again, dentistry hasn't changed. People still need their teeth fixed. You know, there's nothing 
about the, about our industry, you know, no one's taken it over. You know, it's it's still here. We have to remember to um, work with our patients and work with our team and welcome them back because we're the leaders. Just like when he said, don't you ever let your daughters feel they're not enough. I was a leader in my family because my husband at that time was recovering from so many uh, emotional and physical issues. I had to be the leader. So I had to put a smile on my face and I had to show up and I would go and cry, you know, at certain times, you know, I, you have to have kind of a safe room where when you have this stress, you can go and just, you know, cry that I put the visine in my eyes and wipe everything off and get the best care that's stripped down and, uh, and go back. So we have to really, it's as hard as it seems to say, we have to really just sit back, look at the big picture, which is dentistry is going to go on with, it's, it's a setback. It's, you know, it's an awful, horrible, no one could imagine setback, but we can go on and train your brain to focus on that and stop living in the past, which is all of, you know, your full schedule, your, your three, your two hygiene checks while you're working, things that might not, might be different in the future. Uh, your your economic goals. I mean, they're going to be changed now. Mine are. I mean, even as a retired person, all, you know, <laughs> you know, our economic goals are changed too, but not at the same level. But I. So as a person that's been through a lot of pain and suffering in my life, I just want to tell you that doesn't define you as going to have as being miserable. You can choose how to manage this, but it takes work. You have to fight. You can't let it. If you let it go, you end up at the bar at 63 um, or probably dead before that. You know, but. Um, you have to fight it. And so I want to give all of our dentists the courage to fight not only the devastation economically from the coronavirus, but fight the emotional devastation that this is causing us. Well, we have so many things coming. My mom's brother froze to death coming back from a Notre Dame football game, hammered, and um, sat on a park bench and took a, took a little breather. And uh, they found him frozen to death in the morning. Um, that's why, um, no, I mean, it's cra crazy times. So th there's just so many things that my mind is flying to ask you, uh, a, a big dilemma is, um, um, you know, they want to, if, if they're over 50, I, I noticed there's two Americas, there's kind of over 50 and there's young. And, and, you know, one, one of the things that makes me, um, excited about the poor countries is they're so young, like Africa's got a billion people and their median age is 19. I, I don't see, I don't know of anybody at 19 and under in Arizona that's died from this. I don't know anybody. Um, so that's good. But the economic disruption of, the, of the, the global economy, the United Nations is saying that we are going to undergo starvation of biblical proportions. And I've listened to the UN. And so it's kind of, I'm in a rough spot because on the one hand, I have all this sympathy for a bunch of rich dentists in the 20 richest countries in the world, but then I have a, a pretty strong feeling that when this is all done and said, more people will have died from starvation. And, and so the dentist is looking at that because the young dentist is like, we, 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 I got student loans, I bought a practice, we're going back to work, but his old 50-year-old hygienist is like, ah. How, so how do you, um, so it's, it's kind of a, a generational conflict, more personal. I have four boys. They're um, 30, 28, 26, 24. They're fearless. They, they think this is crazy. In fact, it's so embarrassing when they come to the door and the, my grandkid says, well, why can't we go in? And they go, grandpa's scared. He's scared of the flu. <laughs> and, and the little kids look at me like, poor grandpa, why is he scared to come out? But so, so how do you fight this, um, the young dentist wants to open it back up and the old hygienist is like, are, you know, how, how would you put your, your amazing mind around that? <laughs> well, as an, old, as an older person, I've actually spent uh, 12 days in the hospital over the last few weeks and um, much of that time in the Corona wards of two different hospitals. And um, I tested negative, although apparently 30% of the uh, corona tests are false negatives, which is really scary because as soon as you're negative, they kick you out of the, oh, the protected corona ward and put you out on the floor where everyone's exposed. So I, I, I will tell you that um, in, in, in my diagnosis, half the doctor said, you just have corona because you got the ground glass in your lungs and you have all these, every single, I had every, every single symptom. And the other said, well, you have a viral sim sy syndrome that mimics corona. And I was thinking, well, 
does that do all these people want to get that because that does, that's not good so i've been through i mean it is a it, there was a time when i was told i was deathly ill um because they couldn't tell the people in the waiting room because you're by yourself so i've been through you know either very likely corona or its cousin and so it's a scary scary thing and and i could have died i mean i had some i got some permanent heart damage and 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 that ground glass is still in my lung so it's a scary thing for us as older generation to realize this could kill us. My husband has, uh, you know, he's post transplant. He has heart disease. He has diabetes. He's with my daughter now with our three, three grandchildren. I'm waiting for my test to see if I can go pick him up because he would, if he got coronavirus, it would kill him. No question. So there is a legitimate fear in our population. And then with the younger population, there's a legitimate concern and need to move ahead. And so I think eventually what I think is going to happen is we older people are going to have to just start kind of taking care of ourselves and isolating ourselves and let the younger people move ahead. But when it comes to the, to the hygienist or the member of the team, um, I think, you know, hygiene, it's going to take a while with all of the protective equipment we're going to have to wear. And, and of course, hygiene is mostly aerosol. You know, they just do the scaling. Maybe they can adapt around that. I think the hygiene department is probably going to be less for a bit while we're adjusting to this. And so I think it's, 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 you don't ever want to force someone to come into your office to work because the minute something goes wrong, like there's a, there's a crack in their, then they're in 95 mask, you know, there, there's a problem somewhere, you know, you're going to get, they're going to go after the board of dentistry. I mean, we really are a little liable for all of this. So I think it's really important that, that if, when someone says that you could say, well, I, I'm moving ahead. If you're choosing not to come back, we'll get in and make sure you provide all the protective equipment. You have to provide the protective equipment. My daughter has had a, 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 a dentist, you know, she works with dental attorneys. She has some very interesting stories. She had a dentist who um, was taking emergencies in a rural area. Nobody else was really taking him. So she, he had people, he was very busy during this time and he followed all the precautions, but they change daily. If you remember that, you know, one day they say one thing. So he was following all the rules as they were. And, um, and a patient came in that was not his patient. He fixed a bridge, which is a hard thing to do from somebody else. And so he took good care of her. She was not worried about the, the treatment. But she wrote an eight count uh, complaint to the Board of Dentistry that he's now having to address in which she made assumptions that he wasn't wiping down the, the, the doorknobs or he wasn't, you know, she made all kinds of assumptions that he was actually doing what she just couldn't see. But, but the, the point is that our team and our patients are absolutely aware of everything we're supposed to be doing now and they're going to be watching. So we have to make sure we follow the rules, which of course adds stress to everybody. But if you follow the rules and you do everything right, Bite the financial bullet right now, I think we're going to be fine. But as far as that 58 year old hygienist goes, I think we have to let her make that decision and just say, okay, here's the deal. We have a job here for you right now with the protective equipment. We'll do everything we can. But if you choose not to take it, you know, then I'll have to let the, you know, the, um, the state know, you know, I do, uh, unemployment laws are changed between states. Sometimes they'll let you, sometimes they won't let you if you choose not to take the job. But we're going to, you know, we'll let the state know that we have now offered you your job back and we will have to find another hygienist. And, and I think that's what we really just have to do because you put yourself in a really difficult position. Um, if you, you have someone that you try almost, you're almost like in their mind, in their mind, you're not doing this, you're forcing them back to work. But if you let them make that decision, you know, okay, here's a job. This is what, you know, you're a hygienist. This is the job and move ahead. I think we just need to some tough love here on this, but, uh, but do all the right stuff. You, you, we, they will be watching. Um, you know, I, I, you, I've noticed that being a dentist for all these years, so many patients self-report like policemen say, well, you know, policemen, they have the highest suicide rate. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, then, and a dentist would always claim that. Um, I, I, when I looked into it, I think the U.S. soldier takes the the cake. I mean, they're they're like twenty three a day. I I don't think anybody's in that range. But do you think there that does dentistry have any special relationship with suicide? Do you think it is higher than average? Do you think um and if so, why? And talk to that person right now. We got a big footprint with this show. I'm sure there's someone who it's it's crossed their mind. Talk talk to that person about dentistry and suicide. One of the problems we as dentists have is we're perfectionists. That's part of our makeup. We are, if you know, my son was a very high achieving young man. My nephew was a very high achieving young man. We are perfectionists and we're high achievers. And we are very hard on ourselves. 
we don't give ourselves permission to fail, which we do. I mean, I, I remember when I first got out of dental school, anytime I had a root canal, and I love root canals, a root canal that was just a little bit off that, you know, the perfect root canal, I worried about it forever. And of course, those were not the ones that came back. It was the ones where I thought were great and I missed a canal. I mean, you know, so I was worried over nothing. And what that worry took so much time and effort away from my kids and my, the rest of my life. It, 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 it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really bad situation when you worry. And we find that in our brains, we have this little amygdala area uh, that sets off the limbic system that is going crazy right now because it's a fight or flight you know, mechanism. And, um, and everyone's going nuts with the emotional trauma. This was, this was emotional trauma. We are all suffering a major loss just like you know, a loss of a family member. Loss. We were suffering a major loss because we had these expectations of where we were going, how we were gonna do it, how everything was gonna work. And for most of dentistry, that, that, that worked. You know? But something hit us that threw that, you know, threw that all into a disarray. So we are suffering a major loss. So understand, first of all, you are suffering a major loss for those people that are suffering now. You're gonna grieve it. You have to grieve it. There are tasks to grieving. Um, there's 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 a, one of the tasks is you have to accept this is happening and that's what, part of the problem is people can't you know try not you know they're trying to figure out get around it you know people are you know make they have a hard time just accepting this is a new reality I can't go back to the old reality this is a new reality so we have to accept the reality and we have to adjust our lives around it and we have to try to understand that at some point and we're in the first I mean this is a couple I gave a lecture on February 29th a group of, of calamities and catastrophes in the dental office. Uh, to the Minnesota Dental Association, February 29th. I did mention the pandemic of AIDS and I also, you know, biofilm. So I did at least touch on pandemics, but I had no idea that in just a couple of weeks, they'd all be, you know, just traumatized by this. So understand it's a trauma, just like someone who loses a family member. Understand that it takes time to, to work it out. Get help. Get, there's no stigma there should be no stigma to getting help i i have a lot of friends who are therapists and and and, and they they've their work has been very busy recently so get help get help talk to people and get help and know that this is a temporary situation you know suicide is a temporary solution to you know a permanent solution to a temporary problem this is a temporary situation and also as a mother who lost her child if you have mothers out there if you have and this is a dirty trick but i'm using it if there, you have mothers out there, if you have fathers out there, if you have children, you have friends, you have no idea of the tremendous and permanent damage that your suicide, if you hurt yourself, is going to do to them. It, 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 it's, a, it's, a, it, I, I, it's like a brain attack. Our brains are, if you had a heart attack, you get treated, but our brains are attacking us and our brains are telling us that there's a solution that makes this all easier. It doesn't and it makes it miserable for everybody around you. So please, you know, I, I wanna tell you that as a mother who's lost my mother, I've lost my mother, my son, my nephew, as someone who is a survivor of this, let me tell you, I've been there myself. I've been in that terrible place. I have wanted to take my life too. And it's, and it's, and it's your brain is, is lying to you and telling you that this is a better option and it is not. And remember, when a, vi when a, when a vaccine, in this particular problem, when a vaccine comes, that's going to change a lot. And also, let's just take a look. When you, when you can just throw away the, you know, in, in your head the fact you haven't worked for a couple of weeks, that really is, is horrible. But when you look to the future, you know, you're, you're going to change the way you practice aseptically. You're going to, you might have to buy more equipment. You know, you're going to have to wear more stuff. Um, but we've been through that before. We've been through that with the AIDS crisis. When I, was, I graduated in 1981, I practiced in dental school and for a few years after, with no gloves, I mean, except for perio and, and oral surgery. I mean, my hands were in the blood and the goo and the, and the we, that's how we practiced. And then the AIDS epidemic hit. And when the AIDS epidemic hit, that hit, that changed everything for us. We, we wore masks. We thought that our hand pieces, for instance, um, you know, were not made for autoclave and they were made for cold sterilization at the time. So we thought, oh my gosh, we're gonna have to buy a new hand piece every week, you know, for every pay. I mean, we got, we exaggerated. And so everything, at that time, it, it was just, it was a big crisis for us, of course, compared to this, it, it was nothing. But what we did learn is already the technology is changing. Have you looked online about, um, you know, some of these suctions, these air, some of the ways that they'll take the aerosols out of your, out of your room, uh, the technology is changing. So all the stuff that we needed to, to do and get that, this is temporary stuff. 
it's just temporary. So just get through the next few months or six months or a year. It's a small part of your life. It would be one sixty third of my life. And then, you know, you can get to enjoy the rest. I would not, you know, I've had the most wonderful last 10 years and I've had a lot of, I still have a lot of things I've been through, you know, but you, you learn to be resilient and I just want to teach them to be resilient and know they can get through this. And I so, give them a So my homies, dentists, um, they, they tend to be more of the person that always assumes they're the smartest one in the room. I mean, I, I remember one time at Creighton, I almost got punched because it was a physics test. You know, the tests were always 40 questions and I missed, you know, at the end they had the deal and, and I missed one and I, I, it was so mad, but when I said it, I didn't realize the guy next to me had missed like 15. You know, he was ready to, to pound. So we're, we're you know, we, we got A's in math and then the physics and the chemistry. So do, do you think, is that part of the suicide problem? Like, well, how am I going to get help? I mean, I'm already the smartest person in the room. I mean, who could I possibly talk? Do you think it's an ego? I mean, what, what okay. is? Yeah, well, that's where a lot of the stigma comes when it comes to, you know, I'm the smartest person in the room. I'm the one that solves all the problems my brain is uh is not functioning properly because it's it's giving you know it's 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 it, i'm not i'm not a i'm going through a depression i'm going through this grief process i don't know how to handle it but i'm this i'm the smartest in the room so i i cannot get help i'm not going to go to a therapist and have her tell me or him tell me how to manage my life and i'll tell you what i i can tell tell you that from experience because a year after my my son died um i had been having a lot of neck problems and back problems <clears throat> and a year after my son died I found out at the Mayo Clinic, I went to the Mayo Clinic for one day to try to help with my back and my arthritis and all the things we have when we're in our 50s and things aren't working. And I found out that I had a radiculopathy, chronic radiculopathy in my neck that of all places affected my drilling fingers. And I was told in one day I had to stop practicing dentistry. In one day. And, and I want to tell you, that was such a loss for me. And I, I want to, all of you that are practicing, be grateful and happy you could practice because it's a great profession. But I lost that. And one day I lost my ability to practice dentistry. And so um, as I was going through my grief process, and of course it had just been a year since I had lost Eric. Um, and um, so one of the things I do is I work in Rwanda, which is very helpful. We'll talk about that later. But so what I did was I needed help. I, I, you know, now I lost my son and I lost my profession. So what good, you know, what, where is my, you know, what good am I? You know, you, you lose your identity. And and I, I needed to go to a counselor. I needed to go like to a grief counselor or to a regular counselor. And, but so since, but I'm a dentist, right? So I, I didn't want to do that. So what I did is I became a grief counselor and then it took like, I became, I had time on my hands. So I became a grief counselor and I did work in that for a couple of years. And I realized, unfortunately for me, I was helping a lot of people, but I was taking on all their burdens and, and that, you know, that didn't work. I wasn't quite ready for that yet, but we think, you know, how, how arrogant was that of me not to just go, to someone who's trained because I'm the smart one. I mean, that I did that, you know, I did that. So we need to go and get help from people that deal with this every day. These are not unusual thoughts, but they're magnified by our perfectionist mentality and our inability to forgive ourselves when things go wrong, if we have a failure. Now, this, this thing is not a failure. This is something that happened to us. You know, we didn't fail our practices because now we're trying to struggle and pay all our bills. This happened to us. So first of all, get that failure stuff out of your mind because it's a false guilt. It's just not going to go nowhere. But, but we just have to remember it's temporary. It's part-time. We need to get help for our emotional issues so that we can help the rest of our team. And we have to remember that there are a lot of people around us who love us and who will support us, including all the dentists. We all are all in the same boat. Um, we had a um, lady on the show um, a couple of years ago who is a, um, um, a substance abuse counselor. And she was saying that the research, the modern research, there's a lot of overlap between substance abuse and um, substance abuse and mental illness. Is there, uh, is there um, an overlap of substance abuse, mental illness with suicide? Yes, there, there really is. And I think one of the problems that I, I, I wrote an article, I think in 2012 on depression and dentistry, and I was researching it back then. And I was really surprised to, to see that within our profession, we do have a lot of support groups for substance abuse. And, and in fact, the group Dennis, Dennis Helping Dentists also helps now, they've included now depression. So they're starting to include depression. But at that time, and for us older dentists, um, they were leaving depression. Depression was like on the bottom, you know, like there would be a mention, like in the, in the health and wellness of the ADA, you know, Bush, uh, 
uh, studies that they did, there'd be like a little mention of, of a depression, even though the depression rate among dentists is twice as high as a general population. So we do have, we do suffer more from depression, but we want, don't want it for the same reason that I, you know, that I did. I mean, I'm a perfect example. Um, we don't like to get help. Now I did get help, but mine, you know, I got help, but, but you know, I, I kind of had it. I, I just like this, this might be the time if you are having depression where you, this is might be the thing that causes you to like realize you need to go get help. My son's suicide tore me down to nothing. And, and that's when I got help. But I'm so glad I did when I was practicing, when I was, when I was practicing, I have high blood pressure. I take high blood pressure medication and I have depression. So I take depression, antidepressant medication. When I was practicing, the blood pressure medication gave me a cough. It was a side effect, which, which I couldn't even, you know, in, in those days I could kind of work through, but like now you can't have a cough, you know, everybody's uh, hyper aware. The antidepressant only made me feel better so that I could do my job better and I could be around the people that I loved and, and be good to them, you know, be better for them. Um, it, sometimes it takes a while to figure out, you know, uh, the counseling part or the medication part. Sometimes it takes a while to figure that out to get the right dose. So you have to work at it just like any other illness. But mental illness is an illness just like any, but any, any other illness. And we have to treat it like that. And we have to get rid of the stigma in our profession to go out and get some help. And as, as, as a profession, we need to, to work, uh, <clears throat> recognize depression as a significant problem that we have within our profession. And you know, I've seen a, a lot of progress. A lot of the younger kids, maybe they're not aware of progress, but like when we got to school, the, you know, there was no gloves and now it's this far. Um, when I was in um, high school, if you got caught with uh, Coors beer and Jack Daniels, uh, you got your hand spanked. But if you got caught with marijuana, you were off to jail. And um, so uh, um, gay marriage, I mean, I remember um, um, when I was in high school, if a boy admitted he was gay, he was going to get beat up for four years. And now the gay marriage. So the, the, I've seen, um, but one of the stigmas I'm most proud of is um, when I got out of dental school, if you had a substance abuse issue, they took your license away and then they, 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 they tried to put you in jail. And it's been really nice to see these people treating it as a disease. And I still have friends that don't buy into that disease at all and think everyone, um, you know, I, I had a dentist one day, so smart, math, physics, he's so smart. And he says, well, you know, if they would just beat the holy hell out of that guy. You know, he'd never do it again. And I'm just like, dude, you're a dentist. How could you really, you're just going to go beat him up. That's the cure. And wouldn't you think if that was the cure, we would just would have randomly figured that out over the last 30 years. I want to switch gears completely. Um, you graduated in dental school in 81. Yes, I did. And I was uh, 87. So why do I look like your older brother? This is, uh, <laughs> I don't but did, did you, did you feel in 81 that you were a woman entering the man's world of dentistry and that's changed? Or did you feel in 81, it was an, an equal man, woman thing? Cause you were the first <laughs> woman president and some men. So, so did, how, how did you personally feel? Were you a woman in a man's world or was it already equal? Well, I was, it, it was, it was, it was unusual. Um, when I was in, and I just have to tell you a quick story to, to get me there. So you see why I went to dental school, which was a, definitely a seventies um, reason. When I started in college in 1974, my mother had just died. So I, I, I was going through a difficult time uh, in 1974 and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. I was a, I was going to be a psychiatrist and then save her, you know, and of course I couldn't do that anymore. So now it's like, what do I do? But I was a zoology major, so I didn't really know what to do. And then I met this really, really cute guy named Jim Harms. And he wanted to be a dentist. And I was 17 when I started college, so I was very young. So please forgive me for this. But um, so I thought, you know, I'm taking, I'm a zoology major anyway. And, and I, I've never heard of a woman dentist because there really weren't any then at that time that were out practicing. I'd never heard of one. But if I become a dentist, maybe he'll marry me. Okay, that was, that was the time. So please don't, don't uh, have anyone follow that model because it's a bad model. Maybe he'll marry me. And so, um, so I went to my counselor, my first counselor, uh, and after I was a freshman, the first semester, I'd done well, so my grades were good. I went to my counselor and I said, you know, I want to go to dental school, but, um, but I have another issue. I'm, I'm missing some fingers on my right hand. You know, I have another little it was th thalidomide. My mother took thalidomide, so I'm missing some fingers. Are you um, serious? Oh yeah, you're gone, gone on my right hand. So I'm missing some fingers on my right hand. So I said, 
But so I said, you know, I'm seven. I'm, I was, I guess I was 18 by this time. So here's this little 18 year old talking to the, you know, and back in those days, you know, the advisors, they were, this is when I felt the, the discrimination big, you know, big uh, guy. He, he had kind of a bad you know, reputation and he was back there smoking a cigar because everyone smoked, you know, he's smoking a cigar, putting his feet up. He looked at me and he said, of course not. No, you, you can't go to dental school. You only have seven fingers. And I thought for a minute, you know, he's right. What was I thinking? I'll have to find another way to get Jim to marry me. I mean, you know, this is not going to work. And I got up and I was getting ready to close the door. And he said, but maybe if you were a man, they would let you in. And that was when I was determined to go to dental school. I was so mad that he would say that. And I realized that his ego was far more important. I mean, that's all he cared about. Was he didn't know he was ego. So I, my little 18 year old self ran down to the, the counseling office, which, you know, you didn't do, have computers in those days. So you had to go into a room and they were like a hundred older old ladies that were younger than me now but you know they look like they're very old and they did not like the fact that I wanted to change advisors because I was I was not going to change careers I was going to change advisors because I was so angry so I went down to that you know the place and and uh the advisor the advisor people, women gave me a, a, another uh advisor but this one had a worse reputation than the one that I had before and 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 I wouldn't even say what her name was because she was a wonderful woman turned out and she was, she was a geneticist, her name was Dr. Potter. And she was, I was in her class and she was that one up there that said, you know, uh, look to the left, look to the right, half these people are gonna be here in two weeks. And, and she was correct. And, um, and she kind of looked like, and you ever watch The Simpsons? Marge Simpsons has sisters that have their hairs all scraggly and they have a growly voice. They have those little glasses that sit on their nose and they've got a cigarette hanging out of their mouth. That was based on Dr. Potter. That was exactly what she looked like. So I went, but I was so determined. I was so mad at that man that told me I could not go to dental school because I was a woman. So I went to her office. I knocked on the door. I was terrified. I was very shy at the time, very terrified. And this woman, this wonderful woman who I, you know, was the same one that was up at the, you know, it was Dr. Potter, opened the door and she welcomed me in and she sat me down. And I said, well, you know, she's, what's the promise is, well, you know, I want to go to dental school, but I only have seven fingers. What do you think? You know, and she, she looked back and she said, huh, I don't know. I've never been asked that before. So let's find out. And so she made right then, made an appointment with me for this visit Dr. Bushness, who was a director of restorative dentistry at the University of Maryland. She made the appointment. I drove to Maryland, down to Baltimore. Um, I said, I, you know, I want to go to dental school. I only have seven fingers. What do you think? And he said, um, hmm, he said, well, can you hold a mirror with your right hand? I go, yeah, I can hold a mirror. And he said, well, then you go to dental school because one hand goes to dental school, the other one holds a mirror. And, um, and she <laughs> followed me and she, yep, here we go. And she, I'm living proof. So she followed me, she followed my, you know, I ended up getting her in early and so on. She, Dr. Potter was just the best advisor ever. But when I got to dental school, and of course, I had already married my, I, you know, and so of course, the, the moral is I got the guy, you know, this is the good part. So I got, we were married already. So we started dental school together. And, um, and when I went to dental school, and I don't know if it was because I, my husband was in the class, I don't know what it was. I always felt there was, there were two professors there. And fortunately for me, I both ran into both of them my senior year that, that were very um, against women going to dentistry because we were taking all the jobs from the men and we we're just going to have babies. And there were two, there were just two, but out of maybe what, a hundred professors, I don't know how many I actually had, but, um, but the rest of the time I felt very respected um, by my professors and the class and the, my classmates, but there were two that, that really did try to do some damage. It was too late. I was already a senior. Like I was already ready to graduate. Um, so I think it really depends on the person. I do know with my daughter, who's an attorney, she's a, a dental attorney, and you think they would not to have problems, but she gets like mansplained a lot, you know, and uh, by some of the a other attorneys. And, yeah, she's a dental attorney. Yeah, I work for her. That's Pine Lake Law. I work for her. And and so she's working with dentists all the time now with COVID. She's working, she's on, in on, the she does practice transitions. Yeah, she practiced transition, also employment law. And she, what she did um, was she, uh, when this COVID thing hit, she was growing leaps and bounds. So she's, she's a great attorney. When the COVID thing hit, she told all of her clients, she said, you know what, we're in this together. All of the transitions had been kind of canceled for a while. You know, they're coming back and they're still moving ahead. But she said, I'm going to help. If you need any help negotiating your way through this COVID thing, because there's going to be a lot of legal issues, you call me for free. I'm not going to charge. And that goes for any, you know, anybody. What, anybody what's her, what's her name and number? Her name is Hillary, Hillary, H-I-L-L-A-R, Hillary Bacchetti. 
B-E-C-C-H-E-T-T-I, -T 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 her number is 651-428-2253. Okay, Hillary, Hillary Harms Pagetti, JD. Yeah. Hillary. From Pine, Lock, Pine Lake Law Firm. I did know yep. that. Yep. Well, actually, that strategy um, worked. It got your husband and uh, worked for my dad. My dad um, had two brothers. And his youngest brother, Mike, was the first male uh, nurse in Kansas. And it's because when he graduated from Parsons High School in Parsons, Kansas, my Aunt Shirley went off to nursing school. And he was so devastated. He never, he, he wanted to have her married before he got out of high school. So he went to nursing school just to sit by Aunt Shirley. And it took another two years before she finally uh, married him. But then, but then we got exposed to a lot of sexism because when they walked out of school, he was always offered the hospital nursing administrator job. And he was like a 22 year old kid and a boy. And all the 50, 60 year old ladies that were nurses in that hospital for 30 years weren't even considered. So Aunt Shirley was working third shift for half the money that Uncle Mike um, ran the, the whole show in the daytime. And he was always uh, waking up Aunt Shirley because she was the brains and she did most of his homework. And, and, and so did you see any of, um, so did you see any of that coming out of school too? Sexism? Yeah. I, 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 you know, I, when I came out of school, I, um, I, I, I was in the public health service. I went to school on national health service score scholarship, my husband too. So we were in the net, we were in the public health service. So we were commissioned officers for, for a couple of years. And then I taught a little bit at Loyola. Um, I think there, there during the teaching phase, I think there was a, there was a little bit of, there were some issues there where some of the, the professors were not real, you know, I, I felt we're discriminating a little bit. Um, but then I went into private practice and that's, this is a beauty of dentistry for women. Go into private practice, the patients decide who they like, the patients decide who they want to see. That's what's so beautiful about it. And owning a practice, I mean, I, I'm a big advocate of practice ownership. You know, you can do your own thing um, and do it the way you want to do it. And the patients decide whether they come to you or not. And I think that is the great equalizer in dentistry is that for most of us, now when you're working within a, you know, an institutional situation or setting, I think those things come to play and they're, um, they're, they're very subtle. Uh, but the, 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 the wonderful thing is with my daughter too, she just opened her own practice. So, you know, you open your own practice, you do your own thing and it's the clients and the patients uh, that decide. So she, is she, she buys and sells practices? Yeah, she buys it. When she buys, she uh, she buys. She's she's like the little dental advocate. She buys and sells practices, and she works with employment law, and she's also kind of just like almost a counselor to a lot of people. And so um, during this whole COVID thing, she was probably spending seven to eight hours a day working for free, um, helping dentists get because you know you had the loans that came out. How do you apply for these loans? She gave uh, daily updates on what was going on, and uh, and she's had you know she's had. Uh, she's facing the same issues you're talking about where one, one uh, employee says, you know, uh, I, I'm afraid to come back or I want special equipment in my room. And then you have five other employees. Uh, how do you manage that? You know, you have to treat everyone the same. You have to really kind of set some standards and, and, and be tough. Uh, so she's got a lot of those issues that she's dealing with right now. But the mother daughter thing, you should have her. Do she would love to. We're good at that. Okay. Well, well, you, you already got to deal with um, my team, Rebecca. So just. Yeah. Send that to Rebecca and we'll do a one-two punch Be, because that was my, my next question is this. Um, you know, I, I have an MBA from Arizona State University and, and my, my two loves are dentistry and business. I mean, I, I really love them both and I find them very fascinating, very challenging. I, I think it's, um, it, it's just as hard to figure out the economy as it is a root canal. I mean, they're, they're, they're very difficult, but the, the, the math is clear. We've lost 30 million jobs in, in the last month. And so it's no longer a question of this, is this depression error? The, the only difference between a recession and a depression is simply the length of time. So we, we have lost um, what took a thousand days during the Great Depression. We've lost that in a month. And those 30 million Americans, so, so another figure that I'm really interested in looking at is um, BC before Corona and AC after Corona, BC Corona, just about 80% of American adults had a job and now it's below 50%. So 30% of the employed are gone. 
And a lot of them don't even know that their job's not going to be back. There's a lot of people who think, well, they're, as soon as they open back up the restaurant, I'm, I'm the cook. And it's like, it's not going to open back up. So uh, the, and then when you look at dentistry, the number one driver to go to the dentist was that you had a subsidy. Your employer was paying dental insurance. So it's very easy to say that demand has contracted greatly. Um, and then you add on the, 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 the fear and the fear is um, bizarre. Um, my 82 year old mother is fearless because uh, she won't wear a mask because she's Catholic and she has a scapular on. And if someone says, where's your mask? She lifts up her scapular. Have you heard of a scapular with Catholics? No. <laughs> are you, are you <laughs> I'm, I, I'm Catholic. I, mean, I grew up Catholic, but my daughter's Catholic too. So my kids are going to Catholic school. So the, that's her protection is her scapula, right? Yeah, and you're in uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, right? Yeah, yeah. My oldest sister, her monastery is in Lake Elmo. Have you heard of Lake Elmo? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's she, beautiful. So, so, so my mom, you know, my, my mom um, wears a scapula. She doesn't need a mask. So, so all, all, uh, suffice to say, demand could have dropped in half, which means the COVID class of 2020, um, uh, there's a lot of dental associates that aren't being called back because now that demands fall, I don't need an associate. And I don't wanna say this, but I'm gonna say it because it's dentistry uncensored. I think it's great, the, 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 the good news is, is it seems like the, uh, my generation, I graduated May 11, I had my dental office built open by September 21st. I mean, it was like 110 days. And all these young kids for the last 10 years, they give me all these, Socrates, Plato, Aristotle reasons of why they want to go get a job. But you look at them, they change jobs every year. And by the time they've been out of school five years, they've had five jobs and they have nothing nice to say about all five places they've worked for. I mean, they never say, oh, the first and the third were an A. And the, the, there's like, oh, you know, they just tell you everything they did wrong. And, and I'm always thinking, that's because you're a dentist, you're a lawyer, you're a physician. You can't get two dentists to agree that today is Tuesday. So I, so in a way I'm like, well, maybe the silver lining is since if nobody will offer you a job, maybe you'll have to just call your daughter and go buy a damn practice. And, and it seems to me after 32 years of watching this, the people that opened up their own practice, regardless, they are million poor cosmetic and it didn't matter. They just seem more content and happy in this, but the other people that, you know, someone's always telling them what to do. And with, you know, if, if you want a million people to salute you, you need to go into the military or work at Walmart. But man, when you, when, Dennis, it's like herding cats. I mean, when they got eight years of college, they don't need, they don't even care what your opinion is. They already know the answer. So do you think this is going to be, um, would you, would you advise the COVID class 2000? Say, look, you already found $400,000 of other people's money no one's going to hire you. And, and then some people say, well, will this ruin dentistry? Uh, if there's anything I notice on the pandemic in the last two months, there has not been an increase in brushing, flossing and use of mouthwash. <laughs> it's been an increase of eating and snacking and sugar and more sugar. I mean, I almost saw a fist fight break out at Walgreens over the remaining box of M&Ms. I mean, you know, so, so these little cavities are now almost ready for a root canal. So, so would you and your daughter, who's an attorney, if, if they're all calling you crying, saying there's no jobs, there's no jobs, are you just going to like hold up a list of practices for sale? Because, because there should be more demand because I'm 58. I know a lot of 58 to 70 year old dentists that say, you know what, this thing just moved up my retirement. That was the last straw. I didn't need to work. My kids are gone. So I know a lot of older people are saying, yeah, I'm done. You know, let the next generation. So would that be your professional advice that if you can't find a job, just open your own dang store? That is exactly our advice. In fact, uh, we were working on an entrepreneurial program with the Minnesota Dental Association to help give uh, give the dentist here the tools necessary it has everything you need what accountant you know there's a list of all the accountants all the law firms all the you know the people that you need the banks that you need to help you set up a practice because if you want to pay off your four hundred thousand dollar student loan the fastest way you can do it is to be a dentist and take that extra hundred thousand or excuse me be a practice owner take that extra hundred thousand dollars that you're losing in salary every year because you're an associate instead of an owner 
and put that towards paying off your loans. It was the, it's the best financial decision you can make. But you're, but you're, a, you're a mom, and so, so it, it's sad, but it, it is true. Yeah. If you're a woman dentist and a man dentist, guess who's more likely to cook dinner and do the kids' homework? Oh, yes. <laughs> and and, and, I, and I, I've had, um, I had two different women in my house bawling about 15 years apart because they had built up a practice, but her husband got transferred and he's like, come on, honey, let's go. And she's like, go. I mean, you could find another job in Phoenix with 3.8 million people a thousand times easier than I can sell my practice, starting from scratch. And, and they basically realized that their husband was such a Cro-Magnum, Neanderthal, Denosovan, you know, well, I don't know what you call him, homo erectus, that she realized that she wasn't going to blow up the family over it and she just had to suck it up buttercup. So, so a lot of them wrestle with the fact that, well, if I, since I am a girl and we still live in a primitive sexist caveman world, I want to be the best mom. I want to be a better mom than I want to be a better dentist. So would I be a better mom if I worked for somebody else eight to five? So at five o'clock, I take that hat off and I can just be mom. Or would I want to own my own practice? Because if I own my own practice, I can just cancel tomorrow if someone's sick or has a musical or a play. So how would you, if her goal was, I just want to be a better mom than a better dentist, should she own or be an employee? Absolutely own. I'll tell you my own story. You know, I had three children and um, I was at every single play. They had, you know, if they started a sport at four o'clock because they were in junior high. I was there for every single event for, and when you lose one, let me tell you, that really comes into play that you can look back and say, I was at every single thing for him. I didn't, didn't miss a beat with this kid, with my children. Um, so that, so as a, as a practice owner, now the, the key for me, the, the, and when I was, pr I was president of the Minnesota Dental Association for a year, and that, that's a four year commitment of a lot of work, you know, as you move up that ladder. Um, and, and of course, what I did as a first woman, I, I did change some rules and I said, you know, well, you know, uh, I can't be at every, at every subcommittee meeting. I mean, you can run those yourselves and like, give me the notes. Um, I'll go to this, 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 and this. So I did, I, I was able to you know, be at least assertive enough to say, this is where I need to be. So this is what, this is what you get. If you have me as president, I can do this. This is what you get. Um, but also what I did, which I, I think was wonderful is I, I hired I, my own associate. So um, when I was president of the Minnesota Dental Association, I had a wonderful associate so that, um, you know, the, the practice, you know, it's a two person practice. It was a very, you know, we, we built it up. So it need, needed two people to manage it. So it was a two person practice and I, we hired an associate. And so she was kind of there when I, you know, when I was gone a lot. Uh, and then when I was finished with my year, she went out and bought her own practice up, you know, in an area that she wanted to move to. And so I think that, um, and I'm, we're seeing a lot of this as women understand, you know, and, and, and it really is true. I mean, my, I have the most wonderful sons-in-law that you could ever imagine, but, and they're better than my husband. You know, I, I married that wonderful husband, Jim, you know, that I, that I uh, went to dental school for and, uh, and, and he's not that great at doing the homework either, but, and we practice the same job. We have the same job, you know, but I think it's, it is a man, you know, it's something we have to really work hard to overcome. It, it, it's, it's, it shouldn't be that way, but we have to accept reality. Um, but I think that that what we're seeing a lot of here is, you know, women dentists buying a practice and then hiring other women dentists as associates and then maybe buying in together if they're if they're if they're compatible because that's important that they're compatible. If you're going to be a partner with somebody, you better know you better have a few years under your belt to know that it's going to make a good a good pairing. So we do see we do see a lot of that. And so I think it's I think the the most ideal thing for for motherhood is to buy a practice, get an associate. Um, so that gives you a little bit of freedom and then you can decide what you can decide what your hours are and then i think when when women are the 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 owners um they they have a little more understanding uh of the needs of you know to be away for this or be away for that i mean you you know you, you you've been there yourself so you if you go through an experience yourself either as a woman or a man you understand how that sex relates to you know the, the challenges of life so uh, that's what we're seeing a lot of but absolutely um the fact that we owned our, and the other thing about owning a practice is, you know, I had to retire at 54 because I had a sudden, you know, radiculopathy in my hand and had to quit cold turkey. Well, I, I'm retired, you know, and, and, and we, we can live on, you know, we, we don't live extravagantly, but I, I retired at 54, really. Um, and I was able to do that because I had a practice value that I could sell. Did you retire at 54? And is that when you shot that movie Fargo? Because you look like a woman. <laughs> 
doctor and you found out. <laughs> I'm not putting anybody into a, a you know, a chipper, a wood chipper. No, no. Yeah, you look and sound just like that lady. You know, I read that. Theme. I know, I know, I know. I, and I, I thank you. I think she's, she's, she's an amazing actress. A police officer. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and I'm from Maryland actually. I from Maryland. I moved here in 1985, so I have become a Minnesotan, I guess, over those years. I want to, I want to ask you another thing. Um, you know, um, a lot of people, um, don't. You know, they, they, have, they have problems with their parents. You know, they're, they're, their parents weren't perfect. I have five sisters and a brother, and me and my brother think my dad was perfect and walked on water, and I have five sisters, and a couple of them don't agree with that, you know. Um, but um, I kind of always looked at the ADA like that. I mean, I've been a due-paying member my whole life, but I noticed that whenever times get mad, the anti-ADA sediment and... I look at I look at Kathleen O'Loughlin and, and, and she's the executive director. She's a dentist. I love her mostly just because she's 100% Irish and likes Jameson and then uh, and she's a dentist. But the, but no, she's a, um. But I mean, she's just I mean she's she's doing 20 hours a day, seven days a week. And you get on Dental Town and one out of four dentists just think the whole American Dental Association just take the whole building and throw it out in the middle of the lake and they can't do anything right. And it kind of reminds me of kids complained about their parents. And I say their parents because they're all you got. I mean, I mean, it's it's not like the American Chiropractic Association. It's not like the plumbers and the welders. I mean, I, I can't see all the cell phone tower operators getting together and saying, well, we need to take care of the dentist first. And, and um, so what would you say to what I call just a bunch of ungrateful people? Because at that, at that, at that level, how many of those dentists are volunteering? How many hours did you volunteer? I mean, I know when you're president of the Minnesota Dental Association, it's about a three hundred thousand dollar a year salary. Plus, yeah, uh, we got, we got there's zero salary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was joking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I see all of these guys just doing count. It kind of reminds me of that story you started with. Here's a dentist seeing an emergency. All the other dentists are at home hiding and 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 quarantining and she writes a seven page letter to the board and my first Irish instinct is I just want to go find her and go Connor McGregor all over her, you know what I mean but you can and but I look at all I mean just thousands of dentists volunteering all these committees trying to pull it off then one out of four dentists say yeah we should just throw you away I, I, how do you and, and how did you do that because there had to be Minnesota dentists when you were the president of the Minnesota Dental Association that said, you know, she's useless. Uh, she's the problem. How, how do you, how would you coach the, the ADA people who are just getting attacked around the clock? I, first of all, I just have to say, I'm so proud of, you know, having been, I was on the Council on Government Affairs for a while until my son died. In fact, when he died, I was at a meeting there. So I did go back. But so about three years, I was on a Council on Government Affairs. And um, I realize that when you are dealing, well, a lot of this stuff is dealing with the politics. And, and we have to realize that as the American Dental Association, we can't control boards of dentistry. We can't control what the CDC says. We can't control what OSHA says. But we need to be at the table to try to influence them to, to be kinder to dentistry. And, they, and, and dentistry has always been the, like a little sister that, of medicine that they, that they didn't really pay much attention to. But when you take a look, this exact same thing happened back in the days of AIDS. There were a lot of, in fact, when I was a, a, a first started as a spokesperson, one of the things I had to do is represent the organization and for media and television and so on about the dentist that was in, I think somewhere on the East Coast, who was being sued by a patient that had AIDS because the dentist said, I can't treat you in my office, I have to take you somewhere else. And it was a big news item then. And the American Dental Association, when, when they stood up for what was then universal precautions, but now standard precautions, um, and said, look, this is what works. It, which, as it turned out to be true, standard precautions, universal precautions, they work. So as, as a dentist, if, if they're working to protect the patient from you, they're also working to protect you from the patient. Uh, and so you need to see this patient. And that was a very controversial decision, but it was a truthful decision. It was the old, really- and, it and it, to the it, Supreme Court. Yes, and it, and it led the way for, for us. So we practiced from 1980, whatever, nine or something, until now, for all these years, we've been practicing using universal precautions. And until this coronavirus came out, it was working wonderfully. Nobody thought twice about it. 
we were doing it very well. And that's preparing us for all this. And so we're starting like with the universal or standard precautions. And now we are gonna start with dealing with the aerosols. Now we have to manage the aerosols for, for this, what, however period of time we're doing it. And, and the technology is gonna change so that stuff is available that we can use. Um, it, it, when, I, when, I, when I visit, I, had, I was in three hospitals with the coronavirus. One of the hospitals used everything that was reusable. They had reusable gowns, they had those big giant uh, respirator. They look like Darth Vader when they, you know, it's a little scary when they came in the room with their Darth Vader masks on. But everything they had was, re, was either, they only just changed the filters in the respirators, but they had, you know, everything they had was reusable. And they said, well, we've been doing this, you know, we've had these for years. So they, they were not affected at all by the lack of PPE devices with, within that one hospital. So we need to kind of think outside the box and how we're gonna manage what we have in front of us. And this will prepare us for the next thing because now that we're in the age of, a pan, you know, of this pandemic, we don't know if there's gonna be another one coming around the corner and we need to prepare for that. But we can do it. And I think that when people are getting depressed and they're getting overwhelmed and, and they're, they really, if they just take it one step at a time, okay, maybe you're gonna buy you know, an air filter for this room and maybe you're gonna you know, spend money, more money on this and it's gonna be hard for a while, one step at a time and then, then there'll be a vaccine and then we're gonna move on and then something else will happen in 10 years. But, um, but I'm really proud of the American Dental Association for how they handle the AIDS epidemic. And I'm really proud with the, the morning huddle they have every morning so you can kind of check in and find out the latest. But we have to realize that we live in a country that our, our dentistry is not controlled by the American Dental Association. It's controlled by individual boards of dentistry within each individual state. And it's controlled by people, the CDC and the government. And they just have to go and do their best to negotiate. And it's not easy. It's very hard. There's also another public health contingency that comes in. The private practice versus public health is kind of a, a theme that, that kind of uh, uh, is brought up time and time again. So there's, there are different parts of the American Dental Association that we have to kind of find some sort of a common ground with those two groups. You know, um, it's so funny how times change. Um, when the ADA came out with their universal precautions and all that stuff, you know what upset my staff the most but, is we're in Phoenix, Arizona, where, you know, it's 110 every day for six months. We all wore shorts and, and, a, and a little t-shirt that said today's dental. And we had to wear long pants. And that was what, that's where the staff drew the line. I mean, they were livid that uh, they had to wear pants. And it's so funny um, to, just to see the same arguments over and over. In fact, my most fun joke with the, the AIDS though, they'd always say, um, do you sterilize your hand piece? Yes. And I'd say, yes, but why are you concerned? And they say, well, I'm concerned about AIDS. And I go, really? AIDS is a sexually transmitted disease and I have you scheduled for a crown and um, you know, and, uh, but uh, you know, it, it, would, it would shock them, but I, I see the same thing. I mean, you know, just the same arguments. Um, you know, when, when I see someone worried they're going to catch coronavirus off their Amazon package, I remember um, the, the, when they didn't think gay people should eat at the IHOP because they didn't, they didn't sterilize the glass. They just put it in a dishwasher and uh, it's just a lot, lot of history repeating itself. Um, I, you, you promised me an hour. I've already sold you for an hour and 20. Um, when, when you, um, you're going to, I think you should be followed by your daughter. I think that would just be. Yes, a, she would love it. Yeah, she, I would love she's that. A fan too. She, you know, she's a lawyer and she's a fan. So just want to let you know. Yeah. And, um, and I think um, it's kind of funny because you went to dental school to marry your husband. And my uncle Mike went to nursing school to marry my aunt Shirley. And I, I, 32 years later, I think the guys and girls that married someone in their class, I think that was an amazingly great decision. So do you have any advice? What if there, I know that, um, I know that almost everybody that emails me, Howard at dentaltown.com. In fact, shoot me an email, Howard at dentaltown.com or leave notes in the comment on YouTube. I read all those, uh, those comments. Um, they're all under 30. I mean, you know, like maybe one guy a month says, dude, I'm as old as you. They're all kids. You know, they're on Instagram and Snapchat and all that stuff. Um, so final thoughts for the COVID class of 2020. You can do this. We have been through, we've never been through anything like this. You're, you're in uncharted territory and it's scary and it's out of your control. So please learn to accept what's out of your control. Just follow the rules step by step by step by step by step. And eventually you're going to see the light. There's going to be a vaccine and dental practice will get to a, a, a different normal, but it's still the same wonderful profession. And if you need help, 
seek it. There are so many people that love you and depend on you. Do not ruin their lives. Seek help. And, and you, and you educated me on something. I always want to, um, when, when you said the first, you have to accept the, accept it. That, that's what the first thing you said. And I started realizing because it's very confusing when your friends send you stuff that it's a hoax and you're like, do I even want to reply to this text? And you think, well, it's, it's not my sister, it's her kid or cousin or, and, and I, and I just, when you said that, I started realizing maybe, maybe a hoax <clears throat> is their default. They, I mean, it's obviously not a hoax. They got scanning electron microns to picture, but maybe that's just their way of not accepting it. Yes. It's not real. It's a hoax. It's, it's, is that what that is? Yes. It, it's, yes, absolutely. And we are used to being, in, we are kind of control freaks as dentists. That's part of our nature. We tend to want to be in control. We are control freaks. And this is completely out of our control. And even if, let's, let's say it was a hoax. Whether it's a hoax or it's not a hoax, we're here right now. And in order for us to go back to practice, we got to follow every single one of those guidelines and protect our patients. We got to go out there and welcome our patients back with open arms. Let them know we want them to come back because we have to build confidence in our patients. We have to build confidence in our staff. It doesn't matter where it started, how it started. This is what the situation is now. And we just have to deal with it now. And, and because you're using up so many of your brain cells trying to debate yourself over whether it's a hoax or not, it doesn't matter. We have to deal with this right now, and then step by step by step, we'll work our way out. And then final question, um, what's your favorite lesson from Naomi Rhodes? Um, oh my gosh, Naomi Rhodey told me that if, and, and I, I absolutely just love that woman. I cannot believe- you Pronounce it Rhodey? I think so, Rhodey, I, Naomi Rhodey, that's why I, pre we, so. Uh, oh, that's know, a, okay, that's a Minnesota I, thing. That's a Minnesota accent, you know, she does have a Minnesota accent. But she told me this because I've been, I, I started, um, I became, I actually went, when I was, when I was with the American Dental Association as a national spokesperson, I couldn't speak on my own because I was representing them, right? So you can't go out and do your own, I couldn't do this or do your own thing. Um, and so I had to resign from that, which was hard because I just loved all those people there. Uh, and I, I did it because my daughter asked me to work for her. And, um, and so I said, okay, now I'm going to work for my daughter and I'm going to do, become a speaker and I'm going to speak on emotional issues and try to prevent suicides and do all these things. This is my new mission in life. And I ran into Naomi right around that time and she became a mentor to me. And she said to me, because it's kind of scary when you're like, you know, I was like 62 and you're going like, okay, I'm going to begin a new career as a speaker, you know, <laughs> it's, you know, it's a little scary. And she said, Kim, just remember, if you have helped one person, just one person in that audience, that's all you need to help. You have done a great job. And so I think that's, that's, what, that's the best lesson she taught me because I'm, the topics that I speak on, emotional issues and suicide and so on, there have been times when I, I, I think people were helped by just seeing that somebody else went through this and survived. If you're a survivor of something, I'm a survivor of trauma, you know, and we're all going through trauma, um, and I just hope people will know that, that there's a life beyond this. They just have to get through this period and kind of tough it out for this period. And then life will get on. So that was the best lesson. One person, you just have to reach one person and you're a success. And, and, uh, but I just love that woman. She's an amazing woman. I love her to death and her husband and her brother and uh, all that. Um, but I, I gotta, I'll, I'll leave on my, I need to call Naomi. And, um, I think uh, last time I called, uh, I talked to her a couple months ago, but, um, to tell you how fast this is all going, I had a little guilt because her older brother Omar died. And when the funeral was coming about, um, I, I was going, but this is when it just, the Corona stories just kept coming and coming and coming. And, and, I, and I had all these dentists uh, emailing that they were flying in from around the world. I mean, London and Iceland and Australia and Canada and tons of people. And I said, well, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go. And then that morning I thought, this is a really bad idea. There's a bunch of dentists who have been in airplanes for 10, 15 hours. And then at that time when he died, it, it really, I mean, people were just getting woke to this idea. And I chickened out that morning and I, I just, I, I chickened, I felt bad, but where I found relief is I know if I told Naomi, she, you know, she's just the most loving person, she'd say, okay. But I know if I took uh, Omer, he would say, ah, are you kidding me? I wouldn't go to my own funeral. You know what I mean? So I, I, I feel bad that I didn't uh, pay my respects, but uh, that tells you 
how short this pandemic is. I mean, it almost seems like a lifetime ago that, that Omer died and it was just, it was just a few months ago, but it seems like 10 years ago. So um, thank you for um, coming on the show. Thank you for being so honest and transparent.